In this episode of Travelogue, we explore the Holland Bayou grasslands with the Barho Mongols. We witness the challenges facing their traditional way of life and discover old customs that are prevailing in their brave new world. Wow, I feel absolutely tiny standing here. So we left the city to explore the vast Wollongbo grasslands, which is actually the biggest grassland in China. And I'm here to meet the ethnic Mongols who in many places still follow the same traditions they've had for centuries and continue to live their lives on horseback. I'm Turan, welcome to this episode of Travelogue. of China is covered in grasslands. They provide the livelihoods of 800 million people. On the steppes of Hulunbeir live a dozen ethnic minorities whose histories, traditions and lives are deeply entwined with the land. Here in Inner Mongolia, grass is life. So, of all the many different Mongolian tribes out there, the Barhu are definitely the oldest. So, you definitely should come here to get a feeling for Mongolian customs and traditions. Also known as the Baga, during the Mongol Empire, this distinguished clan served the Great Khan's armies. They were originally from the eastern region of Lake Baikal. For over 300 years, the Baga Mongols have lived on Bulambayo's grasslands. These days, this area is a popular tourist attraction. So this is called an Alba, which is uh, basically a sacred pile of rocks, but originally it served a more practical purpose. Um, out on the endless grasslands, it's very easy to get lost, and every time you found one of these, you'd know that it always points south, but later on it gained more spiritual importance. People would bury relics under them, and any time horsemen rode by, they'd get off their horses and circumambulate it three times, chuck a rock on there or uh, bring some sacrificial goods too. In addition to acting as restaurants and accommodation, there are a number of yurts dedicated to showcasing Mongolian culture. From paintings of Genghis Khan's life to contortionists and shamanic dance rituals, you'll get a pretty comprehensive view on what it means to be a Mongol. Ah. So in here you have pretty much everything you'll need in day-to-day -day life as a Mongolian. These are, um, these are, I think these are horse bits and these are reins and they'd be made out of uh, cowhide so they're really nice and strong. Got a bit of fur here, obviously you've got your saddle, that's probably one of the most important things you need on the grasslands. You've got your bronze cooking pots for making milk tea. Um, You've got your winter stuff here, so you've got your winter gloves lined with sheep's wool. Um, but the thing is, these gloves aren't very good for holding the reins of your horse. They'll slip through, so what they'll do instead is put on these babies. They look a bit like bell bottoms, but um, you hold the reins in here, and then you put your hands together, and voila! Your fingers don't freeze off while you're riding the horse. It's all very ingenious but you can't live without even a single one of these items. There's even a Mongolian language class. Sambenu, <laughs> Mongol. Uh, uh, 
I kind of forgot that one. <laughs> My mum would not be happy. Um, but you know what? I noticed these things earlier. And uh, if you switch this on. Uch, uch. See, I knew, I knew that same mother all along. But these are great. I mean, it teaches you Mongolian from a young age. And I love this one because it's so specific to the culture. I mean, like this one. Hacha is, is, a, is a horse bit. And then this is bow and arrow. Lomsom. And then this one, I think it's a horse head fiddle. Modern horse. The modern kur is one of the most important musical instruments in Mongolian culture. Its strings are made of horsehair, while its neck is carved in the shape of a horse head. A common saying goes that a Mongol without a horse is like a bird without wings. Unlike in the West, here horses aren't pets. They're used for transportation, sport, and as sources of food. Foals grow up playing with toddlers, so they're essentially broken in, while adult horses freely roam grasslands. There is a strong relationship of trust. Spectacular. You know, like, yeah, you'll see uh, a lot of videos of horses running around. It always seems kind of surreal, but when you see it in person, it's really powerful. Many of these techniques are battle tested, allowing the rider to shield themselves from arrows while returning fire at full gallop. As Genghis Khan once said, it is easy to conquer the world from the back of a horse. So if you're going to come enjoy some time on the grasslands, you've got to stay in one of these Mongolian yurts. But truth be told, I've stayed in yurts before and um, sometimes they can be a little bit inconvenient. Oh, which is why this place is, uh, I, I think, definitely a step up. Let's check out the bedroom. Oh, this is nice. Look at that. So it's still traditional style, but you know, whereas a, a normal Mongolian yurt would just be big and round, and there'll just be um, not even one bed. Everyone would just kind of be sleeping together. Here, you've actually got separate beds, and I think on a day as hot as this, yep, <laughs> they've got a shower. So <laughs> you've got all the mod cons here, Wi-Fi too, and I think most importantly, oh, when you're just relaxing, you've got a great view of the grasslands and uh, you can watch some people ride horses too. Coming up next, I join a family of modern day herdsmen and discover how the grasslands are changing before soaring over the majestic Argon wetlands. Forty kilometers from Hailar district is the home of Simu Jide and Siren Dasi. Oh, this is nice. So I'm uh, here to meet a family of herdsmen who will hopefully take us out uh, to the grasslands with them today. Hey, Neha. 
。塞班努，你你好，你好，哎，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，你好，很很漂亮，咱们这个环境。<笑>我看这个蒙古包还有现在的建筑哈。嗯，对，那蒙古包是我们现在是直接带游客的。哦哦，咱是准备要出去了吗？啊、嗯，今天想去一下阳一点，或那那和那个什么草场，嗯，看看咱今年的怎么样？行，那我大草我看看，那我跟您一块去，去，好，看吧。这个这位小哥，塞班努，刚刚叫了，啊，你好。Oh, that's like the only two phrases on Mongolian I know. <laughs> oh,塞班努，过一会儿，塞班努，给我打过去。No. <laughs> <laughs> Our family lives nearby a popular tourist hotspot, which is why they now also work in the hospitality industry. Business is good, especially in the summer months. After seeing off their last batch of guests, we set off. As it turns out, their pastures are quite far away, allowing their livestock to graze undisturbed. 那咱们现在有多少牛羊啊？多少头牛羊？有说三十多头，三头，也是三十多头。羊呢？羊，一千来只。哇，那咱们是大户人家了。<笑>现在都做的都不用自己去专门自己去去去看牛羊了。牛羊是劳动力不够，劳动力够的话也自己干。嗯、就是，嗯，这头。有这个旅游这个行业呢，他这面我们自己忙活了，所以就是牛羊那面得找人帮忙的看一下，要自己整过来不是？那现在这个主要咱们收入是靠这个旅游了吗？还是还是放牛羊、嗯？一半一半吧。<笑><笑>而我们走到他们的夏天的牛羊，将会后来被收获作为冬粮。斯莫吉德和斯仁达西长得相差甚远，他们似乎很开心。要睡午觉吗？我们这么多天拍草原，没有就是周围都是草的这种感觉。哎呀，这空气还是很好哈、啊。这个咱们草场多么大呀！五千来亩，五千来亩。还还有吗？那个好吗？车的什么的有吗？反正好的，嗯。您这是进草原吗？进草原呢。啊。天下下雨吧。啊。希望希望下雨啊。这个是酸奶啊，还是奶？酸奶。啊。那每次过来都要是进一下吗？对，我们大草场也进一次，咱们。原来最好的时候草多么高啊！最好的时候这么高了，这也到到大腿这块，大腿一米吧。原来是七月份最好的时候，对，七八月份都是最好的。希望有点雨啊！对呀，希望就下雨下点雨的话，就。<笑>这个、<音> Unfortunately, things seem to be getting worse. On our way to the communal grazing grounds, we pass a desiccated marsh and a river that's almost run dry. For now, at least, it remains a popular watering spot. Although our family's sheep are mostly left to their own devices, they still require regular checkups. Parasitic infections are common, and insecticide must be used to treat affected sheep. Just one guy with a loop on the end of a stick, and uh, that's it. But um. Just want to check the health of these sheep. 这哪能看出来它的那个皮肤上？后边。虫子都在尾巴里头是吗？小羊毛的时候，它可能是拿剪子。哦，咖喱。I've never seen such a fat tail. I always thought it was like a little thing, but no, this this tail is huge. It's all fat. Due to factors such as overgrazing and climate change. The steps of Hollenbeer are deteriorating. Sirendasi says meter high grass is now the stuff of stories, and with this year's grass barely reaching his children's ankles, the future of these plains seems uncertain. 
Sri Muji Deo tells me they'll let their children decide for themselves whether to continue herding or find work in the city. Leaving our family of herdsmen behind, we head northeast towards the Argon River, which forms part of China's border with Russia. Hundreds of lakes and rivers nourish the complex ecosystem of Kulambayo. And though it's mostly known for its grasslands, this region is also rich in wetlands and virgin forests. Okay, here we are. So uh, you have to to want to find them because you have to be quite up close. But in the forest, there's loads of these little uh, good luck charms, and uh, most of them are for love. But this one's like, um, I wish my dad, mum, granddad, and grandma good health. But apparently, this stems from a tradition whereby. Um, Russian ladies would meet Chinese men here in the forest and kind of go on dates, but I guess uh, it's evolved to become more of a, you know, all encompassing. Not far from the birch forest is the Heishantol Wetland Scenic Area. It's set inside a beautiful part of the Argon Wetlands which is home to a huge number of marshes, swamps and bogs. If you spent most of your life in crowded, polluted cities, your lungs will thank you for coming here. Oh, the air here is so fresh. It kind of reminds me a little bit of my home in the UK because I grew up near the forest, but I mean, this is the Oregon wetlands. It's, it's the biggest in Asia, so there isn't really any comparison, but I mean, even though it's not as awe-inspiring as endless grasslands, the wetlands are incredibly important. They're basically the lungs of the planet. So it's an incredibly diverse and fragile ecosystem that we need to protect. During dry season, these wetlands provide shelter for millions of birds migrating from East Asia to Australia. You won't find any red-crowned cranes or wild geese during summer, but that doesn't mean you can't stay in these nifty log cabins and observe the wetlands many other species of wildlife. If you're brave, you can even get a bird's eye view of the Argon wetlands. So, uh, got my GoPro at the ready. Um, you know, one of the best ways to see the grasslands is from the sky, although, you know, I'm afraid of heights, it's something I have to do, because apparently it's, uh, it's going to be really pretty, going to do a bit of paragliding, I just hope it's safe, they're like laying out this parachute, and the parachute looks really small, I mean, there's going to be the two of us, so I won't be by myself screaming in the air, but, um, <laughs> you should facing me, should you? As the ground slowly drifts away, the majesty of nature's design is revealed. Up here, everything man-made seems insignificant. The grasslands really do stretch as far as the eye can see. And the Argon wetlands form a vast organic labyrinth that sprawls across the land. This really is the best way to see Hulambeo.
Coming up next, we'll find out just why Mongols are said to be born in the saddle, and get front row seats for the curiously named Three Games of Men. Oh, it's pretty impressive. So this is the Gandro Temple, which is the largest Tibetan temple here in Hulambuya. And tomorrow they're going to be consecrating one of their new halls, which is why you've got this chalk drawing here, lots of preparations, but um, you should go in and have a look first. Oh, it's an interesting mix of styles here. So this um, temple has a, a mixture of Han Chinese uh, Tibetan and Mongolian styles. You can kind of see the Han Chinese everywhere, but if you look at this, straight away you know this is from Tibetan Buddhism. You've got these prayer flags with um, protective animals on uh, you know, the, the four cardinal points, north, east, south, west. And then um, if you're a, a pilgrim or a, you know, if you've come to visit the temple, uh, you'd see these prayer wheels and uh, you'd know that while you're walking clockwise around the temple that you should come here and spin these prayer wheels because they have mantras inside these scriptures. It's equivalent to reciting the mantras yourself. So it helps you accumulate good karma. Um, but this place was originally built in the Qing Dynasty and it looks very new because it's been renovated many, many times. Originally, actually, there were lots of Mongolian yurts situated uh, on the outskirts of the temple, which um, housed monks, but uh, you won't really see that many Mongolian influences these days. But they're still trying to get back um, the glory and the, uh, the grandeur of the temple uh, when it was originally founded. Right now, it's only about two thirds of the original size, but it's really pretty big in my opinion. The temple's name plaque was personally inscribed by Emperor Qianlong, the longest reigning ruler in Chinese history. At its height, Gandro Temple housed four and a half thousand lamas, and even today remains very influential. So it looks like uh, people are still making preparations for tomorrow's consecration. To celebrate the consecration, there will be a whole day of festivities tomorrow. So uh, it's the big day of the ceremony. See for yourself, it's three in the morning. I mean, this is when I usually get back home after a heavy night of drinking. But um, the horse race is going to be held in half an hour because apparently this is when horses are at their best. I just hope the riders are going to be awake. To be honest, we had it easy. A lot of people traveled for days to get here and many camped out on the grasslands. Okay, so uh, this is really surprising for me. Uh, on the way here, I was talking to our driver and I was like, why do they have to get up so early for this? And he said, it's because uh, if we start racing, it's nice and cool, so the horses don't sweat as much. And all of the riders, all of the jockeys are children, because obviously they're, they're lighter. You're <laughs> old. <笑>没有这些呢你多大了十九十九十六号你其他七多少年了哦我突然发现你没有做满安你不做这个满安不安全吧这样我骑手嘛都习惯了都习惯了你去原来参过这个比赛参加过这个比赛是吗<笑> <哦, 你去原来参过这个比赛>, <笑> I know who I've got my money on. 
Most of these kids are still in primary school, yet today they'll race 25 kilometers cross country. They are the bravest children I've ever met. Their hooves really do thunder. These kids make riding look so easy, as if horse and jockey were one. Many of them will compete again immediately after this race, but this time on different mounts. After a while, there is a clear winner. And he is just eight years old. So it looks like uh, everything has begun. This is an Aba ceremony and uh, they're quite common in Mongolian culture but they're also very very important and each place has its own set of rules and rites. Here the Lamas are reciting their mantras and then once they're done they're going to circumambulate the Aba three times and then head up. But it's not just the Lamas, the laymen are coming here in a bit and uh, they're also going to be celebrating the Aba. This Alba ceremony takes place just once a year, and many pilgrims have travelled from afar to take part in it. They're here to pray for good health and fortune. After an Aobao ceremony, there's usually a mini Nadam festival. The Mongols fondly refer to it as the three games of men, namely horse racing, archery and wrestling. Originally sporting competitions, Nadam's latest soldiers Genghis Khan believed that wrestling was a great way of keeping his army combat ready. With no weight, age or time limits, Mongolian wrestling is the ultimate test of strength and endurance. So uh, it's been a pretty exciting day today and I'm kind of surprised actually because after the very you know, serious religious occasion of the Abar ceremony to uh, see all of these festivities, um, in Mongolian there's something called a Nadam festival which is basically um, means to play and it's one of the most important events during the Mongolian calendar and you can kind of tell the spirit of the Mongolian people already they're bold, they're forthright, they're brave I mean from wrestling and riding bareback this morning and even though some people have upgraded to cars and motorbikes the spirit of the grassland still remains <laughs> Bağım kasada sarsa bir kere, 